On this week in Enterprise Tech, Chibert takes us back to Wispapalooza with another great guest to talk about gigabit routers and fiber network. Curtis takes us through top six non-technical degrees for cybersecurity. Plus, Curtis, Heather, and I talk with a great guest, Alex Hendorniwani, VP of Product Marketing at Thousand Eyes, to talk about network visibility and performance. Twyant on the set. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is... This is Twyat. This, this Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 369, recorded November 22nd, 2019. You can't hide your thousand eyes. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Ring Central. With Ring Central, you'll get everything you need in one place for your business communication needs. Sign up for a free demo or request a quote today at ringcentral.com slash enterprise. And by Taylor Store. Taylor Store makes high quality dress shirts that are fully customizable by you. With their exclusive trial price, each new customer gets their dress shirt starting from $39. From the basic essentials to the most high end details, Taylor Store has got you covered. Go to taylorstore.com slash enterprise, offer code enterprise. And by Brave. Brave is the browser reimagined. Switch now to get unmatched speed and privacy and stop trackers from following you. Save battery life and earn rewards by opting into privacy respecting ads. Brave is free and easy to switch to. Go to brave.com slash twit and switch to Brave today. Welcome to Twyat, This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world's connected. I'm your host, Louis Moreska, your guide through this big, giant world of the enterprise, but I definitely can't guide you by myself. I need to bring in the professionals, the experts in their field, starting with our resident Wi-Fi expert from the Lone Star State, our very own Mrs. Heather Williams. Welcome back, Mo. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Thanks. Now you've been uh, you've been quite busy lately. Uh, you what, what's been what's actually been keeping you busy? <laughs> well, I keep telling you that some um, some dummy had the idea of promoting me to management, so I've been living <laughs> that that kind of dream. Um, and I'm getting over a, a bad head cold just in time to head to my favorite place in winter, London, um, for uh, Black Hat. So I'll be bundling up and uh, looking for a nice strong cup of tea this time next week. Oh, fantastic. So it's actually next week. We'll have to look out for a lot of content from there. Fantastic. Well, welcome back. Of course, our next co-host is the senior editor at Dark Reading and our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, happy holidays, my friend. And the happiest of holidays to you, my friend. It's uh, so good to see you. And uh, it's good to get, get in the spirit of giving thanks by being grateful for a, a wonderful show like this and for the entirety of of the Twyat Riot that lets us do it. Now, you've actually been pretty busy this past month as well with Maker Fair, conferences galore. Has it, have things calmed down for you? Uh, things have calmed down just a little bit. Uh, we've got to, I got to spend an entire week at, just here in the, the swamp and have enjoyed it. Uh, we'll be here until Thanksgiving Day when uh, we're heading off to spend the holiday with with our son in uh, in the frozen tundra up north. Uh, so that'll give us something else to be grateful for when we get back to the sunshine state a few days later. Well, hopefully next week is restful for everyone. But before we get to take a rest, we have a jam-packed show for you today. Now, Cheaper is going to go take us through another interesting deep dive of Wispapalooza with the CEO of Baltic Networks to discuss a Gigabit Core i7 router with fiber. That sounds fun. Plus, Curtis is going to take us through the six top non-technical degrees for cybersecurity. Looking forward to that. And we actually have another great guest, Alex Hendorniwani, VP of Product Marketing at Thousand Eyes. And he's going to talk about the trends of this year in network infrastructure, cloud services, and of course, network visibility. But before we get into all that goodness, there's actually been some pretty interesting stories this week in the news. So let's go ahead and jump into this week's blips. Now, AI is a market trend, and it's literally creating ways for businesses to process data in new ways. Now, in fact, mobile deep learning is becoming one of the most active areas of research in artificial intelligence. But designing deep learning models is definitely not trivial. Plus, you need to design ones that can execute efficiently 
on mobile devices and runtimes. Now, this causes platforms to rethink many of the architecture paradigms in neural networks. Now, to make this a good, efficient, and experience for mobile environments, deep learning models need to balance the accuracy of complex neural network structures with the performance constraints of mobile runtimes. Now, if you want to see a set of complex models out there, check out the ones that represent computer vision. Now, to lower the barrier of entry and reduce some of the complexity here, back in 27, Google actually introduced mobile nets. This is a family of computer vision models based on TensorFlow. Now, as part of the release, contains small, low-latency, low-power models parameterized to meet the resource constraints of many use cases. Now, they can be built for classifications, detection, embeddings, and segmentation. Now, if you're familiar with neural networks and its architecture, depth-wise separable convolution is a depth-wise convolution followed by a point-wise convolution. That's a complex set of uh, layers there. Now, in V1 of MobileNet, the depth-wise convolution applies at just a single filter to each input channel. Now, Google has made many incremental improved improvements to these models with version 2. And in 2018, V2 built on top of the ideas of its predecessor and it actually incorporated new ways to optimize the architecture for tasks such as classification, object detection, and semantic segmentation. But this past month, the third revision of the model and libraries were released, and one of the main focuses was actually around AutoML. Now, this is the best way to find a possible neural network architecture for a given problem. Now, this is quite different than the handcrafted design of the previous versions. Specifically, V3 leverages two AutoML techniques, and that's MNAST-NET and net adapt. Now, V3 first searches for course architectures using MNAS, which uses reinforcement learning to select the optimal configuration from a discrete set of choices. Now, this architecture has also been incorporated in a bunch of popular frameworks, such as TensorFlow Lite as well. Now, MobileNet's platform needs to carefully balance the advancements in the computer vision and deep learning in general with the limitations of mobile environments. But with V3, it has shown a significant set of improvements over previous architectures. For instance, in object detection tasks, V3 operates 25% less latency than the same accuracy of the previous models. Now, V3 is open source, and it opens the door to all sorts of interesting architectures that haven't been thought of before. Now, if you're looking to learn neural networks, especially for mobile environments, you might want to check out MobileNet. Is the FCC trying to run out the clock? A recent article in Tech Dirt by Carl Boda ratchets up the snark level to Mo. The report is about a congressional letter sent to the FCC Chairman Pai about his agency's failure to follow up on accusations that U.S. wireless carriers have been collecting and reselling users' location data to, as the author writes, any nitwit with a nickel. An article he wrote earlier this year describes the problem as being another day, another massive cellular location data privacy scandal will probably do nothing about. He turns out to have been prophetic. In the letter, lawmakers accused Chairman Pai of deliberately slow rolling any investigation into privacy violations, stating, despite announcing that it began an investigation into the wireless carriers after being made aware of the allegations in 2018, the FCC has failed to date to take any action. And now time is running out since the statute of limitations gives the FCC one year to act. We write regarding our growing concern that the Federal Communications Commission is failing in its duty to enforce the laws Congress passed to protect consumers' privacy. This committee has repeatedly urged you to act quickly to protect consumers' privacy interests and unfortunately, you have failed to do so. Boda also notes that while this administration has been quick to criticize privacy violations when the offender is an entity like Facebook, the FCC has been apathetic about enforcing the law when telecoms are the per perpetrators. In addition to, making, to taking almost no action to curb the plague of robodialers that have forced many Americans to screen all calls, not just the ones from their mothers, the rise of SIM hijacking hasn't raised so much as an eyebrow at the FCC. Not only do we not know what carriers have done with almost a decade worth of your location data, we can't even be certain that they have quit collecting it or that they no longer monetize it as they assure the public they have. From the war on net neutrality to a complete disregard to Americans' privacy, Chairman Pai has proven time and again that he's a wolf in the hen house and there's a chicken for every telecom pot. 1.2 billion, that's with a B, records exposed in the latest massive 
data breach. And have we finally lost our ability to be shocked by the scale of a data breach? Well, the latest incident in which security researchers have discovered an unsecured server containing four terabytes of personal data, that's 1.2 billion records in total exposed and easily accessible online, may give us the answer. The open server held profiles of hundreds of millions of people, and that leaked data includes home and cell phone numbers, social media profiles for Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and GitHub, work history seemingly pulled from LinkedIn, nearly 50 million unique phone numbers, and 622 million unique email addresses. Now, if there's any good news to be found in this massive pile of stuff, it's that the database didn't contain sensitive data like credit card numbers, social security numbers, or passwords. Now, this trove of information was made up of four separate data sets, and of these, three had labels indicating they were from People Data Labs, a data broker claiming to sell information on more than 1.5 billion people, including billions of email addresses and Facebook URLs and IDs. It's not at all clear who owned the server, which traced back to Google Cloud Services, or who stored the information there. It's also unclear whether anyone but the researcher had found and downloaded it. And researchers who found the data alerted the FBI, and the server and data were taken down. But as Senator Everett Dirksen once said when talking about federal budgets, billion here, billion there, and pretty soon you're talking about a real data breach. Is net neutrality still a thing? Well, according to the former, former AT&T president, John Stankey, now the CEO of Warner Media, when asked about AT&T abusing their powers during a session at Recode's Code Media Conference, it's a non-existent one. Well, now, according to him, there's absolutely nothing that's occurring, and we would be hard-pressed to find instances of any behavior otherwise. What do you think, Twilight Riot? Can we trust him? Now, if you remember, AT&T imposes arbitrary and unnecessary usage caps and overage fees on its broadband lines. Now, if you're an AT&T broadband customer who uses more than 150 gigabytes on DSL to a terabyte in fiber monthly, you'll suddenly face having to pay $10 per each additional 50 gigabytes consumed. Is there a technical limitation that's causing this fees? I don't think so. While well, these caps have been in place for a while, and a few years ago, AT&T began eliminating these restrictions for its broadband customers if you use AT&T's own streaming platforms. Use Netflix instead? Well, you'll face a significantly higher broadband bill than you think. What do you think? Does this sound like net neutrality? I don't know. Now, didn't AT&T coin the term sponsored data, which actually involves letting companies literally buy their way to network favoritism if they had enough cash? Well, AT&T saw resistance to these kinds of playing field tilting business models. And in fact, the previous FCC was gearing up to crack down on this behavior. Now, when asked about AT&T predatory behavior, Dan Stankey brushed it aside and told attendees to not be concerned about ISPs, but be more concerned about places like Google and Apple services. Now, I don't know about you, but comments like these bring out the skeptic in me and, want, and I want to trust the ISPs even less. Maybe one day we'll get transparency from our providers and the net will be a neutral place to live. A victory for privacy rights. And finally, some good news on the privacy front and why I'm proudly wearing my EFF hoodie today. This week, a federal court ruled that suspicionless searches of international travelers' electronics at U.S. ports of entry are unconstitutional. This ruling comes in response to a law lawsuit filed on behalf of 10 U.S. citizens and one lawful resident. According to the ACLU, each had their smartphones and laptops searched, even though there was no individualized suspicion. Last year, the Department of Homeland Security enacted policies that gave officials wide legal authority to search the belongings, including electronic devices, of travelers entering and exiting the country. This allowed agents to search for information that was accessible on the device itself and through the software. Officers have been allowed to request passcodes and detain devices that were encrypted or inaccessible for further review. In the suit, ACLU lawyers argued that Customs and Border Protection and ICE policies that allow border searches of electronic devices without a warrant violate the Fourth Amendment. The ruling limits those searches now to those based on a reasonable suspicion, but stopped short of requiring a warrant. An attorney with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, EFF, 
stated, this is a great day for travelers who can now cross the international border without fear that the government will, in absence of any suspicion, ransack the extraordinarily sensitive information we all carry in our electronic devices. As someone headed next week to Black Hat in Europe, I would like to thank EFF for their work and let them know that this month's Patreon donation is in the mail. Hey, good news for sports fans. The leak of CIA and NSA hacking tools has brought parity to nation state hacking capabilities. You know, it's getting much, much harder to handicap the cybersecurity games because new research shows the public leaks of classified NSA and CIA hacking tools in 2016 and 27 appear to have leveled the playing field for nation state cyber criminals. Threat intelligence firm Dark Owl recently analyzed dark web data gathered from public and proprietary sources and found the leaked cyber weapons have strengthened the ability of emerging nation state actors to attack rivals and project attribution to others. The leaked cyber weapons <clears throat> have given adversaries new ways to capture text, video, and images from target systems, including IoT and smart TVs, attack smart vehicles, hide implants in windows and other operating systems, and conduct a range of other surreptitious actions. Significantly, the, the leaks also made widely available capabilities that let attackers conceal the origins of an attack or make it appear as if an attack originate from, well, somewhere else entirely. Details on the NSA and CIA tools and processes have been extensively studied on the dark web and are now, now part of the arsenal of, well, everyone, from nation-state actors to ordinary cyber criminals. Now, with all of that going on, the U.S., Russia, and China continue to be cyber superpowers in terms of skills, influence, money, and manpower, but other less powerful nations have acquired formidable strength because of their access to these previously unattainable tools. Israel, Germany, and the UK rank just behind the top three nations in their cyber capabilities, followed by Ukraine, France, Iran, and India. But it is Iran and North Korea who have improved greatly and who present a major threat to U.S. interests in cyberspace. What's one way to ensure connected devices are controlled with an iron fist? Well, you force them to install custom software so you can take control. That's exactly what Russia is trying to do by July 2020. Now, the latest law passed states that the sale of certain devices are banned unless they have pre-installed with Russian software. Now, the main reason for such a law, according to the supports of the law, so people who are supporting the law, is that it's aimed to promote Russian technology and make it easier for people in the country to use their gadgets. What do you believe? I don't know if I believe that or not. Well, now if you buy your device abroad, the law does not apply, but any Russian alternative will require this software to be installed. Don't know about you, but this might force people to start buying abroad as well. Now, another interesting part here is that a complete list of devices has not yet been supplied, but when it does, it will come directly from the government. Now, to clear up any confusion that this may be used for surveillance purposes, Parliament reps stated that when you buy a device that have pre-installed apps on it, which may be Western-born apps, they might be confused that there, no, that there might not be any domestic alternatives for those apps. They just wanted Russian alternatives installed side-by-side -side with the rest Western ones, so people have options. You can never have too many options, right, people? Well, the Association of Trading Companies and Manufacturing Manufacturers of Electrical Household and Computer Equipment, or Raytech, has said that it will not be possible to install Russian-made software on some devices and that the international companies behind those gadgets may actually leave the Russian market as a result of this law. Now, Russian... Uh, Russia has introduced tougher internet laws over the last five years, including requiring search engines to delete some search results and calling on messaging services to share encryption keys. Some recent legislation actually comes just weeks after the country introduced new controls on the internet through its sovereign internet law. Now, in theory, the law gives officials wide-ranging powers to restrict traffic on the Russian web. Now, the Kremlin says it will improve cybersecurity, but critics are fearing the worst that the government will go so far as to create a firewall, just like China. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, we have the bites. But before we get to that, we have to thank a really great sponsor of this week in enterprise tech, 
and that's Ring Central. Now, handling tele- telecommunications in any organization is not easy. It can sometimes really just get in the way of the organization to really truly be productive. Now, I've been in the industry for almost 20 years, and I can tell you it's sometimes a crutch for enterprise and small businesses. Now, that's where Ring Central steps in and streamlines this for your organization. So you can focus more on your business and less on the logistics. With Ring Central, you get a total customer and employee engagement solution. Now check out some of the features. Now to collaborate and communicate throughout your organization, you get a full cloud PBX with flexible and powerful cloud voice on desktop or mobile with advanced administration and analytics. Now Ring Central also has team messaging. Now this allows you to collaborate anytime, anywhere on any device with video file sharing tasks and more. And you want and you want to actually do remote video meetings? Well, you can host up to 200 participants with clear, reliable voice and HD video across devices. Now, if you want to handle inbound communications from customers with the contact center, you can actually have intelligent inbound call routing, CRM integrations, and workforce optimization to drive that efficiency. Now, Ring Central also lets you enhance your digital engagement. It's a single platform to connect with customers wherever they are online. Plus, for you to engage current and future customers and turn any agent into an outbound blended powerhouse. Now, it's really a one cloud communication platform. It's open, so you can actually extend and customize it with APIs out of the box integrations. It's global because you can get affordable PBX in 40 countries phone numbers in 100 100 plus countries, and service in 10 plus languages. Plus, it gives you insightful analytics with their intuitive dashboard, reports, and notifications as well to drive better outcomes and productivity. Now, they add AI, which actually leverages Ring Central data with powerful AI workflows to drive better decisions. Now, Ring Central is a complete communication solution from one vendor, and it starts as low as $19.99, saving you money and cutting your phone costs by at least 30%. Now, Ring Central also makes it easy to switch from your current provider. In fact, Ring Central's customer service is available 24-7 via telephone, live chat, and email if you need them. When I set mine up, it was super easy. I actually just gave my phone number I wanted to use for forwarding, set up the app, and bam, I was done. And all, and away I went to be able to collaborate and communicate without worrying about the details. Use Ring Central for all your communication needs. Sign up for a free demo or request a quote today at ringcentral.com slash enterprise. That's R-I-N-G central.com slash enterprise. And we thank Ring Central for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, it's now time for the bites, and we're going to start the bites with another inside look of Wispalooza from Mr. Brian Chi, our geek in paradise. And this time, he's going to talk with the CEO of Baltic Networks to discuss discuss a gigabit core i7 router with fiber. Chibert, take it away. I got very excited when I saw this product, and it's running ESXi, which for the enterprise IT operation. This makes it a lot easier to bring in and run a virtualized environment, containers and so forth, or specialized applications. So what kind of niche does this fit for the WISP industry? That's right, Brian. So we chose ESXi because it's a very flexible platform um, to virtualize uh, various services on top of this. So um, a lot of our customers like to run Microtik um, router OS, and Microtik has a cloud-hosted um, software application that will run on top of ESXi and provide high performance routing on this platform. Um, we are getting other uh, customers asking us for things like uh, an EPC packet core for LTE, um, maybe additional bandwidth applications, DNS servers, um, anything internet you know, application related you can run alongside uh, on this box and uh, up until the you know you've maxed out the resources sure. but um, it's very flexible in the fact that you can you can you can do that. So okay, and so I was talking to your um, engineers yesterday, and they they did tell me it's running the free version of ESXi at the moment. That's correct. But if say for instance I'm an enterprise user and I have my ESXi licenses, there's no reason why I can't use that with vCenter, and a couple of these guys, and I can still do vMotion, right? No, that's correct. So actually, we have customers that have taken this, and all you do is you just go in and drop in your own license key in the box. Mm-hmm. It'll automatically relicense. You can attach it to your vCenter and manage it through your vCenter application. So, so real nice, flexible platform. Mm-hmm. A heck of a lot 
um, less expensive and easier for me to run. Not to mention rack space costs me money. That's right. And this is a real nice alternative to say a big traditional server. That's right, that's right. And actually um, we're experimenting with um, an application or we're looking to experiment with an application called a free range routing. It's okay. an open source uh, routing um, platform as well as uh, uh, something called Intel Clear Linux. It's, a, right, right. it's something that just came out recently. And so we actually hope to have a prototype of that running soon on this as well, because um, with free range routing, you can actually approach um, you know, uh, speeds and, and functionality to like a $15,000 Juniper router all in a $2,500 box. Very cool. So we are talking to Brian Vargas of Baltic Networks and you know, you are not a traditional box moving distributor. And thank you so very much well, for your time. Thank you, Brian. This is a really great product. Thank you, Brian, from Baltic Networks and Cheever for the great information. Well, folks, we have to get to another bite here as well. We want to increase your cybersecurity knowledge base, but you don't need a degree to do it. We're going to go through the top six non-technical degrees for cybersecurity. Over to you, Curtis. Thank you, Lou. Now, many people believe that especially for cybersecurity, if you're going to succeed in the field, you have to start out with a degree in computer science or another technical field. A couple of weeks ago, I went to the ISC Squared conference, talked to their COO, and he was very eager to disabuse that notion. And there's a very practical reason why it turns out that the gap between the number of cybersecurity professionals we need globally and the number that we have is about 4 million individuals. And the sad fact is that even if every single student enrolled in a computer science program worldwide went into cybersecurity, we couldn't close the gap. So we have to look elsewhere. The question is, where else do we look? And for many cybersecurity pros, the answer is simple. We look to the liberal arts. Now, there are a lot of reasons for this. Most of them have to do with the characteristics of the individuals who tend to go into the liberal arts. The other thing is some of the skills, and these are things often referred to as soft skills that you tend to learn in a liberal arts degree. You know, skills like learning to pick up information, learning to communicate information, and frequently the one that some technical folks lack most heavily, the ability to listen. For example, individuals from different backgrounds tend to, to bring these communication and listening skills to the table differently, and they also bring different perspectives. Those different perspectives are another reason why the cybersecurity pros have said we need people from different backgrounds. Because if everyone in IT, if everyone in cybersecurity has come from the same background, they're going to tend to look at the problem in the same way. And that leads to situations where they can miss things that come from other directions. So, so what kind of degrees should we look for if we're looking to fill the ranks of cybersecurity and general IT professionals? I took a look in an article that I recently wrote at Dark Reading at six of these. In the first one was math. Um, why? Well, people who are in math tend to have a holistic view of problem solving. They tend to be able to use symbolic language to solve problems, and they tend to have a thinking process that leads to symbolic reasoning for solving those problems. Furthermore, often people who go into math love solving puzzles. And as anyone who's in cybersecurity can tell you, puzzle solving is one of those great prerequisite skills for cybersecurity. The next, business. You know, business analysts tend to take a process-oriented approach to solving problems. And that's the same sort of thing that can lead to both IT analysts and cybersecurity 
cybersecurity analyst success, the process-oriented uh, approach, and the ability to think of cybersecurity, especially in terms of the business repercussions, the business process, and the business effects. Number three might not surprise you so much. It's psychology. This is especially true when it comes to looking at things like the, um, the whole notion of social engineering. Why do people open phishing emails? Why do people click on strange URLs? Why do they insist on opening that strange attachment to their email? All of those things are the realm of the psychologist and the psychology major. Understanding how people act and why can be critical. The next one is similar, sociology, but sociology tends to look at this from the group perspective rather than just the individual. So understanding how cybersecurity or IT can work within the group, how different, if you will, tribes within the organization look at these things differently can help in understanding both the kind of threats that can have the most impact and the way to help build defenses that employees won't try to get around. Now, the third one, or the fifth one we're up to, surprised me a little bit, philosophy. Now, I had one of the people that I talked to, uh, a woman named um, Christine Todd, who was executive director of the Commission on Enhancing National Cybersecurity under President Obama, and she said she would love it if everyone who took a program in IT, in software development, in cybersecurity, were required to take a, man, a minor in ethics and philosophy. Why? Because understanding why it's important to behave ethically, how to build a system of ethical behavior, and how to build processes around those ethical behaviors are critical. Uh, it's also worth noting that traditionally math, you know, remember back the number one thing we talked about was part of the philosophy department in the traditional liberal arts scheme. Why? Because it's all about a different way of thinking and a way of approaching problems. Now, finally is one that was near and dear to my heart, music. You know, musicians have long been noted for the way that they can get into software development. As a matter of fact, GE, one of the early companies developing software, had a preference for hiring music majors. And Tom Garuba, who's CISO at a company called Shared Assessment, sees no gap between the skills required for being a musician and the skills required to develop software and be part of a cybersecurity team. Uh, he says whether you are a sheet music reader or someone who plays by ear, there are skills that translate well to cybersecurity, things from following a plan to thinking on your feet to being part of a team. Now, I'm going to turn to my co-host on this, and Lou, I want to go to you first. You work with people on many different teams. Have you seen people who have succeeded in technical positions without having a computer science degree? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's, um, you know, there's there's not as many of them um, than there are people who have computer science, you know, computer engineering, those types of degrees. But there are, you know, there's a lot of people out there that have them. And, you know, in fact, some of them have been some of the best managers, engineers, and or PMs I've ever worked with only because they have a more broader view uh, of of uh, of the of the market of the uh, of the industry itself um, and they bring that perspective that's a little different than just focusing on a lot of the, the computer science uh, you know the whole computer science paradigm so I, I definitely think that it, it's not a restriction um, you know we we don't uh, discriminate based off of what degree you get um, you know we we want to make sure that you know, anybody who's hired has the skills that we're looking for. Uh, and if they come from a history background or, a, you know, a theology background, a philosophy background, 
that doesn't mean that you're not going to have the skills that we're looking for uh, for leadership and, um, and and so on and so forth. So, you know, this company alone here at Microsoft, uh, in fact, I sit next to somebody uh, through this wall here who uh, doesn't come from a com computer science background, um, who their manager uh, of one of our teams, uh, engineering teams. So, I, you know, I, I think that um, you know, it's definitely a possibility and, uh, and those are the skills that we need in, in this day and age for sure. Well, Mo, I, I want to turn to you because I know that you are in management as well. And so from your perspective, what would you look for first, uh, a particular college degree with a particular major or are there individual characteristics that you find more important? You know, I just love this topic. I think we could do a whole show on it. Um, and we, we actually, you had a, a, a bite earlier this year where we talked about just the, uh, the importance of diversity um, when you're um, filling out a team. So uh, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna challenge, how much do we really need a degree at all anymore? Um, I, I can tell you as somebody who swore that my uh, tombstone was going to read, I put four kids through college. Um, and uh, my philosophy 20 years ago was come hell or high water, I was going to find a way to do that. Um, no, no kid in the family was going to end up without going to college. I am almost wondering if I may be the last generation of parents, or at least right now um, in America, that's going to uh, have that that attitude. Um, I know that when I broke into tech, and by the way, I don't have a uh, an undergraduate degree in computer science. In fact, if I had, I think that it would have actually been a detriment because at the time, um, any degree I would have gotten would have either been electrical engineering um, or it would have been computer science, which meant that I was mostly focused on being uh, a software engineer or a coder. And I know that's uh, near and dear to lose heart, but that simply would not have been me. And most of what I ended up doing in tech, there were no classes for any of that. So I, I, I don't judge a tech uh, degree or use that as a, as a, uh, a, a, as a, a litmus for anything. And um, I'm going to uh, mimic something that was said earlier in the chat room. Me, um, my, the first thing I look for is critical thinking skills, and uh, because you know that's either something that is taught or learned early on. Um, I don't think that you can. I almost think it's a hardwire thing. I don't know that that's actually something that can be acquired um, if you if you manage to escape childhood. Um, without having that skill set. Um, and then the ability to work with uh, others and appreciate the differences. And and I really do love that you're talking about the fact that you can't solve um, problems that you don't understand, uh, uh, new problems that are in every evolving problems like we see with cybersecurity by just using the same hammer. Um, so I think diversity, a different way of thinking, the different backgrounds, I think all of that is is really important. Well, I have to say I'm biased in this regard uh, because my bachelor's degree is in art. Uh, I then went and did my first pass to graduate school in computer science, but I'm a big believer in liberal arts. Uh, Lou, to, to, to end this particular bite, I want to turn back to you. Lou brought up something very provocative, and it's something that, to be honest, the folks at ISC Squared did bring up, and that's the, the question of whether a bachelor's degree is really required for the bulk of positions in either software development or cybersecurity. You know, they are of the belief that, especially if someone has been through, say, the military and picked up skills there in cybersecurity, there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to go directly into an enterprise position. Um, to my, a two-pronged question to you. First, do you agree that that could be true? And second, how would you go about convincing HR of that truth when they when it comes to putting together uh, position announcements? So I would say that the truth is that it's not required. Um, it's mainly like I think you've kind of pointed it out quite a bit is that we're looking for particular skills. We're not looking for particular degrees. If you've gained those skills from the industry, that's important. If you gain the skills from by yourself, that's important. It all depends on the degree of skill. Uh, and your capabilities. And I can tell you that, you know, at least at this company, I can control, I actually control what we post for our position. So I can post out there 
the skills that I'm looking for. And, um, you know, and as long as the people who are applying have those skills, uh, we don't have to look for particular degrees and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, in fact, a lot of positions out there, uh, no matter what the organization, not just here at Microsoft, a lot of organizations are doing this. I know Apple's doing it. I know Google's doing it. Is they're posting what they're looking for and they're willing to to go through the process of vetting the person, uh, especially if they have had a good amount of experience and or have been in the industry for a while uh, and, and, and wanted to make a change to their career. Um, and I, so I can tell you that very, very certainly that, uh, you know, People from all parts of the industry um, have been able to get jobs uh, even recently because companies, like Heather said, are starting to see the writing on the wall and they know that, uh, you know, just one hammer is not going to do it all, right? And one type of hammer. We need all types. We need all types of people. We need all types of th uh, critical thinkers from all different parts of the industry to be able to solve a problem from all different vectors. And I think that that's really the key here. Um, and so I would say, you know, some groups, you know, for instance, I've seen researching groups from some companies and so on and so forth that might require some particular degrees, like a doctorate in, uh, you know, neural networks or something like that. Uh, but again, there are a lot of more positions out there today that don't require that. Um, and they just require that you've gained some skills somewhere. And of course, w it, even if you put it on your resume if, and you get to the front door, th we're going to vet you, right? A company is going to vet you. They're going to they're going to take you through the interviewing process, which, which is what the whole process is supposed to be about. It's a journey to make sure that not only do you have the skills, but you're also fluent in those skills. Um, and so, um, you know, that's kind of the whole process. And I really think that the industry is definitely shifting towards that for sure. Well, thanks, Curtis. I appreciate it. This was a great bite. And like, like Heather said, we probably could do an entire show on this one subject. So we'll definitely have to come back to it at a later date. But you know what? We have another part of the show that we have to get to, and that's to bring the guest in to drop some knowledge on the Twilight Riot. And today we have a great guest. So, But before we do that, we actually have to thank another sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that is Taylor Store. Now, it's hard to find custom quality shirts that fit us. I know this. It's very, very hard for me. And that's why I am super excited to have Taylor Store on Twyatt. And they offer high quality made to order dress shirts for both men and women. And they're fully customizable and tailored to your measurements. Now, first of all, not only do they, do they actually have endless set of combinations, but the experience is actually a ton of fun too. Now, you, you, you don't actually know your size. Well, they have an amazing, fun, Size Me app that actually revolutionizes the measurement process using advanced technology and algorithms. You use your mobile device, you point it at yourself, and bam, they get the right size. I'm not kidding here. They actually get the right size. No longer you need to use a tape measure here. You receive your shirt, and it fits perfectly. In the voice of Ace Ventura, like a glove, and it only took a couple seconds to do it, and Taylor had my measurements, and I got focused on the fun part of the experience. That's to pick all the different choices that I get to pick when I'm building out my shirt. Now, as a 100% carbon-neutral business, Taylor Store challenges the traditional fashion industry with its new way to purchase clothes. Now, ready-made garments and off-the-rack sizes have no place in this modern world, and people are individuals, and Taylor Store embraces that individualism. Now, there are virtually endless options here to choose from. They've had, they have a selection of finished designs, and then you can actually directly purchase them, or you can actually use a starting point from them for customization. Now, Taylor Store has a perfect fit guarantee that takes, takes away the risk of ordering. Now, if your shirt doesn't fit as you would like, they will remake it for free. Just snap two pictures of you wearing the shirt that make the necessary adjustments and send you a new shirt promptly at no cost. There are no returns. The faulty shirt is yours to keep or even give it to care charity. Gone are the days when custom made to measure shirts were an item of luxury. Wherever you are, look and feel your very best in perfect fit clothes made only for you by Taylor Store. With their exclusive trial price, each new customer gets their dress shirt starting from only $39. That's 50% off the regular price. Go to taylorstore.com slash enterprise with offer code enterprise to get yours. You also get free shipping. Terms and conditions apply. That's taylorstore.com slash enterprise with offer code enterprise. Experience the unrivaled fit and comfort of your Taylor Store's handpicked fabrics for yourself. And we thank Taylor Store for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's now my favorite part of the show. We get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twilight Riot. And today we have Alex Henthordiwani, VP of Product Marketing at Thousand Eyes. Welcome back to the show, Alex. Thanks. Great to be here. 
Now, we, we had you back on episode 334, um, but we want to give the audience a quick refresher, and we want to start with you because our audience loves to hear people's journey through tech, their origin stories, and I know we covered it back then, but we need a refresher. So can you maybe take us through the your journey through tech and what, what kind of brought you to Thousand Eyes? Sure. Well, first of all, I also have a liberal arts degree and um, French literature, in fact. So, um, But when I first started in tech was at a systems integration shop, working on all sorts of uh, stuff from long ago. But I first contact I had with the internet was with a company called Livingston Enterprises early on in doing um, concentrators connecting um, for ISPs and uh, working on early protocols like the RADIUS protocol and things like that. So I've just kind of been journeying through since then, since the early days of the commercial internet and uh, going through uh, security products, um, different types of management products, some uh, orchestration, networking products, um, and more recently hitting the kind of cloud scale and, and cloud visibility space. And that's what Thousand Eyes is about, all about. So Thousand Eyes is really just... Uh, you know, it's been a kind of an evolution, right? But but Thousand Eyes is really about giving you the visibility so you can own this new environment that you actually don't control or literally own, right? The internet, the cloud. I mean, so the cloud is new, your new data center. Uh, SaaS is your new application stack, right? And the internet is your new network. You don't own or control all of that, but you still have to, if you're in IT, you still have to deliver, right? So you need visibility, and that's not the traditional way of gathering data from equipment you own because you don't own it all anymore. It's a active monitoring way of going out and gathering um, app experience and uh, service status and uh, network and, and, and network path and, and routing data uh, so that you can see how everything's going for you users and everything that's happening underneath it so that you know when something's going wrong, why and who to talk to and have information, be able to help them help you. Fantastic. Now, back on episode 334, we talked a lot about kind of the trends of the time and what we were seeing and, you know, obviously network visibility and how we talked a little bit about um, hybrid clouds and people moving to the cloud. But things change quickly, obviously, um, especially for organizations as they kind of develop and they want to move more things to the cloud or even in, in the hybrid scenarios. What's changed between the, that and now? What, what kind of trends are we seeing? So it's interesting. Um some of the big trends actually um, are around uh, the different kind of controls and, and how enterprises are encountering those controls. So there's this whole thing about Russia, right, the the sovereign Internet motions. Um, one of the things that's been really interesting for a lot of our customers is just how the Internet and how the cloud performs in and out of China. Um, that's that's one that's an interesting mix of cloud arch architecture Internet architecture and sovereign architecture, right? Because the Great Firewall influences not just the privacy aspect or what's allowed per se, but performance. So how do you how do you serve users in China? Um, and, you know, if you're a U.S. business or a Western business and you've got branch offices there, you've you've got business happening there, but you've got cloud hosting or SaaS applications that are hosted elsewhere. How do you make that work? So there's there's a lot of as we get more globalized, we're seeing, you know, the impact of this really changing cloud and internet architecture, but also just the impact of these kind of sovereign moves as well. Right now, obviously, Thousand Eyes has a, a very unique vantage point here. Um, you know, in fact, it's it's funny. I think just last week we were talking about deploying. Uh, a new CDN within the sovereign cloud within China um, because of the fact that a lot of Chinese customers were complaining about performance and we you know went and did an, al an analysis of it and found you know what we, we need to stick something within this firewall so that we can actually get uh, better performance for them so I think it's one of those things but again you know sometimes organizations they don't have the capabilities or the resources to do all of that how is how is Thousand Eyes helping here and and what are some of the new things that you're seeing uh, when it comes to uh, performance uh, of across the net and, and with these hybrid scenarios? So some of the major things that we're seeing, um, you know, is that as as uh, you know, enterprises are trying to move into the cloud, 
um, that they're encountering the fact that they don't necessarily understand the architectures of how they're being, how all of that is being delivered. Right? Particularly like in, in networking, how exactly is traffic delivered? How is it delivered in, you know, from a user location to a hosting region, right? Um, or how is it, um, you know, how does in region traffic actually work so that if you're we've got microservice dis, microservices distributed between regions how does that actually work so that's is really is has uh, been doing a lot of uh, research work and and study and in an education of our customers and of the industry around those kind of topics so you know obviously you pointed out obviously the services have, they have different performance variations with them as you kind of no matter where you're at in the world um, how does this type of visibility change the way organizations are set up their their infrastructure? Well, one of the things that you know we at Thousand Eyes have kind of been becoming more aware of is that first of all, you know, it's no longer about a single cloud provider for a lot of folks, um, and there's it's now becoming really common to talk to a lot of customers who who are going multi cloud. One maybe because they've just had some. Um, you know, one part of the organization was building in IBM and another one is building in AWS. Now they're going to China and they're thinking about Alibaba Cloud. So they're, um, you know, the visibility is now helping them to make better choices. For example, one question comes, well, let's say I've got IBM Cloud and I've got AWS. Is, is it true that all cloud providers um, peer? equally in all places. And if that's not true, is that going to influence maybe where I choose, which regions I choose to place my workloads in so that they get the best uh, interconnectivity, you know, across clouds. That's a really, you know, kind of a simple kind of uh, a question to ask. But if you don't have the visibility to, to understand that, you're not going to make the best choice. That's a, uh, so that's one example. Another one is just... Um, Say, for example, if you're trying to move more towards um, hybrid or SD-WANs, you want to get your branches, branch offices onto the internet to broadband connectivity. Do I understand how those all perform? And can I assume, for example, that you know, in the U.S. there's never going to be an anomaly in how that all works? Uh, we, it's, in a mature, it's a mature um, connectivity market, but uh, will, can I just count on it being always sort of correct? You know? Or and so visibility helps you understand whether or not there are anomalies that you're walking into, um, maybe comparatively even between broadband providers, or detect when things go wrong that you wouldn't otherwise be able to to find a fix for. So it's good you mentioned it because that kind of segues into the next part here is that you guys put out a great report here and it talks a lot about some of the benchmarks that you're seeing uh, from the cloud providers out there. Can you maybe just take us through some of it and what you're seeing, maybe even from just the kind of the, the U.S. perspective of it? Yeah, so we put out a cloud performance benchmark report uh, very recently. Um, there's a nice streaming event uh, that we did on that. And one of the things that's really interesting about this is that last year we did our first version of this where we covered AWS, Azure, and GCP. And this year we, we expanded to IBM and Alibaba Cloud. And a um, couple of things. One high-level question we, you know, we asked last year and we asked again this year is, how do user locations connect to the cloud? And what we found is there's two major camps and kind of a hybrid. So AWS and Alibaba Cloud both heavily lean on the internet to carry user traffic to the regions. Uh, GCP and Azure heavily use their backbones, so they bring user traffic into the backbones sooner. And IBM is a little bit of a hybrid. They do a little bit of both depending on which region. So that's an interesting one just because if you are, if the internet exposure makes a difference to you and to your use case, and that's important to know. Um, one interesting thing we just generally noticed is that, um, you know, like Alibaba, their their architectural approach and a number of other things, they mirror AWS to a very large degree. Uh, so that was kind of interesting to see. Um, another thing is that in terms of the, um, you know, here's a good, good broadband. What we found is that generally speaking, broadband works well, but we did find routing anomalies, even in the U.S., where 
Um, and again, these may may happen. We found one uh, just it's just an anomaly, right? It's this is not going to happen all the time. Whereas in some you know regions of the world, you may have difficult internet performance more normally, like in some parts of Asia. But in the U.S., you would expect it to be generally speaking good, and and overall it is. But what we found is, you know, measuring from multiple cities across uh, six broadband providers to, you know, the U.S.-based uh, regions of the five cloud providers that, okay, generally it's, you're going to get speed of light performance. But then occasionally we'll find something like, hey, you know, there was a, a hairpin from the West Coast user location to the East Coast and then back again, you know, from one broadband provider, right? And it's not, you know, it's it's the Internet, right? So things can go wrong. And let's say, for example, if you were rolling out, you know, a SUN and you were going to take on broadband, all of a sudden you roll into a, a level of performance that is pretty low by comparison, but from what you would have expected. And then you're sitting there wondering, why is this so slow? And if you don't have a way to see what's happening, you're going to really struggle with that because that might become your baseline um, expectation. And then is that is that going to really... Uh, is that is that something that you can sell to your users? Whereas if you can see what's going on, you can remediate that ahead of time. Or if it happens in operations, you can fix it. Well, I definitely want to dig into the report a little more because there's a bunch of questions that we have. And if, uh, definitely my co-host has some questions here. But before we do that, we have to thank another great sponsor of, uh, of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that is Brave. Now, the majority of things you do today include surfing the web. Now, your users do it. You do it. Your organization does it. There aren't many options out there today for browsers that focus on security and privacy. Now, that's why you need to check out Brave. Now, Brave is the next generation web browser built by a team that's focused on privacy, security, and performance. Think about that. Usually those those attributes don't actually go together, right? They are pioneering a better internet with privacy by default. No. Brave gives you control over who has access to your online activity. No. Get Really unmatched speed, security, and privacy, including shields that block data grabbing ads and trackers. And it's really, really fast. And it can save you battery life and reduce your costs. Now, you all you want to you actually want to stop trackers and creepy ads from following you across the web, right? Well, Brave can do it. Brave is unlike any other browser. It's it, that gives you speed online privacy that blocks trackers, a great user experience, and get this. It's free. They know your data is important, which is why they make sure your data stays private to you. Now, why should you pick Brave over other browsers? Well, it's an easy browser to use. Users can switch browsers and get set up really quickly. It saves battery life. It feels just like using Chrome without being tracked. Now, you can import your bit, your bookmarks with one click. All your favorite Chrome extensions are available on work and available for it's available for Mac, Windows, Linux, Android, and iOS. And it actually supports up to 56 languages. And it's available worldwide. Now, Brave rewards you actually by having advertisers pay you for your attention. You can actually opt into Brave ads and you'll get rewarded with BAT tokens. These are basic attention tokens. Now, this supports actually content creators and allows you to access premium content. Plus, you can use those rewards to easily tip your favorite content creators in Brave. Now, their goal is to help fix the web, improve privacy, but give publishers back their fair share of the web revenue. Now, join Brave's mission to fix the internet. You know, you can trust Brave because it was co-founded by Brendan Ike and Brian Bondi. Brendan Ike was previously the co-founder of Mozilla Firefox and the creator of JavaScript. Brave also includes options such as Private Window with Tor for those seeking even more advanced privacy and safety. Listeners of This Week in Enterprise Tech can easily download Brave right now. Go to brave.com slash twit and switch to Brave today. That's brave.com slash twit. Yesterday was about big tech. Today is about us. And we thank Brave for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, we've been talking about market trends and network visibility, but I do want to bring my co-host back in because they have some great questions about what Thousand Eyes is doing in this report. I want to start with Heather. Heather, you wanted to talk a little about latency. Yeah, and actually, I'm really glad that you uh, brought up that hairpin um, uh, that you saw with Verizon. Um, and you're right, without having uh, seen this and knowing what, what is normal, um, the increased uh, latency in that uh, th that scenario, which I, I believe uh, you saw had uh, gone on for a couple of months um, before uh, it was it was actually discovered. Um, 
it reminds me my uh, old science teacher used to say if you don't use units all you've done is math so if you don't if you don't have a, a measurement of what is normal then you don't you won't see when there's an anomaly uh, mm-hmm. and know to go look at it and um, and, and try to fix it so I wanted to ask um, in addition to that you uh, it, at one point in the report you noticed that um, Google apparently doesn't know how to get from Europe to India. And so the only way to, for traffic to flow on uh, for Google um, between India and Europe is to go all the way around the world. So the latency in that case is um, like 350 milliseconds, which is crazy, like three times what everybody else's is. But it's also the same as the latency that I was seeing um, back uh, the the last couple of years. I've had just um, a satellite uh, for my backhaul. And it's the same distance to go from the base station to the satellite as it is the circumference of the world. And so I was wondering if there was a if that was the same thing. And have you seen um, that Google is addressing um, finding a gateway between India and, and Europe of all places? Yeah, so last year we saw that issue where paths were going around from, let's say, from Europe across the Atlantic through the U.S., across the Pacific to India. And we'd heard that they were upgrading their fiber infrastructure, um, and we understand that has happened. And I think now, if you look at their fiber map, they've up- updated their fiber map, and they actually have a link now. What we found during our measurement period um, was that the uh, weather and, and that that uh, new link may have been in place if it, it hadn't been published uh, as of when we were really measuring or even when we we're just about to publish the report. Uh, that that uh, link update hadn't been posted. But importantly for us, what we saw was that whether it exists or not, all the routes did not yet follow that. So we still were seeing routes go around that that same way. Now, we're going to be tracking this because we know that they've, they're have they making or have made this update. And so we should see it change um, soon, if not, you know. It, so we're, we're definitely going to track an update. This is a really interesting case because... Um, the you know obviously Google has a massive investment in its network and generally speaking it works quite well. So this was an interesting gap that obviously they they look to fill and it looks like they are going to do that. So we'll be interested to to measure that. But it is a huge latency difference. And the thing is that sometimes you'll find uh, what we found in certain places where the fiber is more sparse, like in Asia, that you can have really interesting differences in latency depending on who's peered with who in the internet. Um, or how the the path is going across uh, different networks. And so that can make up a really significant amount of latency. The other thing that's interesting is about the the overall sort of predictability. Uh, One of the things I've heard a lot about, particularly in places like Asia, it's not so much latency. I mean, 350 milliseconds is a lot. But let's say if you're you're dealing with a 10 or 20 second 20 millisecond difference in latency between one provider and another it may not that may not be the killer difference the difference might be how predictable is that latency so if you think of this as a as a longer term sort of uh, you know you know kind of uh, sort of deviation you know that if you're deviating by more over time that's actually more damaging to user experience because, uh, you know, let's say if you have a 50 millisecond or 60 millisecond, you know, uh, average latency, but your standard deviation is 50 milliseconds, you know, when it, when it spikes that high, people really gonna, can really notice it, right? So, um, and that, what's also interesting is we really looked at things like standard deviation of, of latency versus jitter, because typically network engineers thinking about, uh, you know, difference in latency as a jitter. And what we noticed is over time, deviation, the standard deviation of latency could could vary significantly over time, longer range times, like because we were measuring over some weeks, whereas jitter would be like a micro variation, right? Uh, so that jitter might follow the, 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 the ups and downs of the, the larger standard deviation. And it's a larger standard deviation that will make more of a difference to uh, web applications, maybe. Um, and the jitter will make more of a difference to real time. But it's one of the things that we, in, we looked at. And so as a final note, you know, there are places where that deviation is higher in certain parts of Asia, Latin America, and things like that. And so that was one of the things that we looked at as well. It's not just about your raw performance. It's how predictable it is. 
And actually, I'm really glad you clarified that because I was watching the um, the presentation and she was talking about the variation in the in the latency. And since I come from an ATM background, uh, I was translating that to jitter in my head until I realized that we were talking about a longitudinal study, not those you know microsecond uh, delays. Um, and so the the uh, variation in jitter was uh, variation in latency was actually uh, really interesting. Um, so since we've uh, already aired to everyone that we both have a liberal arts background, um, this is going to be a fairly safe question because I'm going to completely exhaust my knowledge of of quantum mechanics in this. Um, but going back to you know the Niels Bohr, the uh, Heisenberg principle of once you observe something, you've you've forever changed it. Uh, how is it that you? I, I was looking at the 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 first part of the report where you're talking about doing active. Um, uh, observations. How is it that you're actually getting this data, and how and and being ass- assured that you're not actually um, affecting the the network at, that you're actually trying to measure? It's a good question. So uh, first of all, the, the way the Thousand Eyes does its measurements is. Uh, um, Basically, what we're doing is sending relatively small bursts of TCP traffic, typically. Uh, and, and in this study, we're doing, we have agents, you know, deployed software, you know, kind of monitoring our ag- agents. Uh, we have them pre-deployed in, in the cloud providers. We also have a whole bunch of them deployed across the globe, hundreds of them in, I don't know, closing on 200 cities, right? So we're doing agent-to-agent measurements here. So we have ability to see from both sides. We're doing bidirectionals. We're doing typically TCP bursts, and we choose TCP because it's what applications use. And so uh, the TCP gets treated um, like an application as opposed to if you're using ICMP or something like that, which can get dropped or rate limited in weird ways. But when we send these bursts, they're, they're relatively small. So that the amount of bandwidth footprint we're exercising for these active monitoring measurements is pretty small. For the purposes of a you know month-long study or something like that, we're doing typically 10-minute uh, intervals. So we're not impacting really the networks at all in any substantive way from a bandwidth point of view. So we're not going to influence uh, things by in terms of congesting anything or anything like that. So um, and but it's still representative of you know kind of a uh, an application style set of traffic if that makes sense. Thank you. Well, do you want to bring Kurt back in because um, Kurt has some questions about design, right, Kurt? Absolutely. You know, when you get right down to it, what you what you're describing in so many cases is sort of adding visibility later to a content delivery network or an application infrastructure that was designed with no thought of visibility. And my question is, do you ever talk to customers who are bringing you in at the design stage? I mean, do any of these network architects, any of these content delivery architects, think about the idea of visibility as they're building the infrastructure? Uh, that's a great question, and, and I can answer it in two ways. One is um, we actually do, first of all, um, do uh, work with and, and communicate with the cloud providers themselves and a lot of providers who are our customers, SaaS companies and all that sort of thing. So they actually do use the kind of measurements. So we have 20 of, 20 of the top 25 SaaS providers as, as our customers. And recently, interesting, just so you know, uh, Microsoft Azure Networking published a set of inter-region metrics, uh, latency stats, uh, powered by Thousand Eyes. Um, so one of the things that we do see is that the, those who are really building large-scale cloud services uh, rely on Thousand Eyes measurements, not just for operational purposes, although they do. Uh, by the way, fascinating talk uh, given by an uh, Office 365 um, architect recently and how they use Thousand Eyes data to uh, trigger automated remediation of their entire service paths globally for Office 365. But they actually use it for planning purposes too. So that on the, on the provider side, the large-scale folks, they're using Thousand Eyes for that purpose to tune optimize. But the other thing I think we've started to see, but also really advocate a lot, and it's starting to take hold, I think, is um, we really we talk about a thousand eyes we, we, with customers. We talk about what we call the cloud readiness lifecycle, which is the idea that when you go and are getting ready to deploy, you're going into SaaS. Um, 
let's say you're on Salesforce and you're moving to the new Lightning experience or something like that, and now you're getting this really dynamic um, web application, single page web application. There's a ton of interaction with the back end. How's it going to behave when you make that change? We're seeing more of our enterprise customers now thinking ahead about those kinds of changes and getting visibility or moving it left in their cycle, as it were, right? They're, they're starting to gather more baseline data. And uh, there's a, actually a really interesting case study we did. Actually, I just did a talk at Dreamforce with a company called Schneider Electric. They're a big you know, power automation company. But they were moving to, um, to Lightning Experience. And they actually did a whole bunch of baselining uh, with Thousand Eyes uh, measurements to understand how it's going to behave from different points in the world and are using that as part of how they migrate the platform. So we're starting to see more customers do that because they're they're kind of realizing, uh, maybe slowly, but the enterprises are realizing that you just can't deploy out into such un- an unpredictable environment as the internet without getting some data first. Well, it's interesting that you talk about getting the data first because it seems like we've gone through for the last at least five years a move to, you know, agile and DevOps that has said deploy, deploy, deploy will fill in things like visibility and security and all of these other things later. Are you finding you think that companies are pulling back a bit from that particular interpretation of what it means to be agile? Or are companies just getting better at the the whole agile discipline so that they're able to prepare a little bit better and and build these things in rather than having to go back and and retrofit them uh, after deployment? So my perspective is that if you're doing agile and if you're really leaning forward into that world, oftentimes what you're trying to do is culturally you're you're copying the uh, you know the those big technical leaders, right? The the folks you know they're the Googles and the Facebooks and everybody else. You know it's the um, you know the site reliability engineering. Um, you know all those kind of manifestos. And one of the things that I think culturally that is getting picked up from them because is because this is really true about a lot of the tech companies as they're obsessed with measurement, right? And with data. So they may be really agile, but they're always measuring and they, they have an obsession with, you know, getting, um, you know, golden signals and other, other metrics. So I think as agile sort of development practices, um, develop and as, as more and more weight is being put on the cloud, I do think you see more of that sort of desire to integrate good signals, um, so uh, we do see that. I mean, I think one of the challenges in the past was the kinds of measurements you could get. Um, now, obviously, there, there, there are certain kinds of measurements you do for the application developers will use. But let's say on the operational basis, you know, the kind of synthetics or active monitoring kind of things that we do in the past were not very accessible um, or they, they're too fragile. And, you know, so we see in a thousand eyes recently, we kind of put out a new version of our synthetics, for example, that has a JavaScript back end. And it's all, you know, sort of um, much more um, friendly to integrate into CI CD pipelines, things like that. So I think as visibility evolves, one that it's more uh, complete in terms of being uh, seeing into low observability domains like the internet and cloud, um, the fact that those things cause problems and developers as well as ops folks become aware of that, the friendlier uh, those kinds of visibility, that kind of visibility gets to being integrated. Um, I think you know all those things and the desire, the cultural desire to become data obsessed and not just you know, develop and, you know, release software. All those things, I think, come together and make it so that we're seeing more of that kind of integrated way of approaching uh, getting visibility data into the process. But the, the one other thing I'll say is that for a lot of our enterprises, we're seeing them move not just to migrate to the cloud, as it were, to public cloud, even though that's definitely happening. Anything customer-facing that they're building is going to go in the cloud. But otherwise, they're really moving towards SaaS heavily, so that's a, you know, it's a kind of like not just cloud first. I've, I started to hear the tier of the term cloud first and build last. So there's consuming more and building less. 
And so that also influences, you know, some of the practice like, okay, well, we're not even able to gather like RUM data, you know, um, because we don't even own the application. So now we really need to lean forward into the visibility stuff uh, to, to have some level of control or management. Alex, thank you so much for being here. Unfortunately, we're running a little low on time. I do want to give you a chance to maybe tell the folks at home where they can find more about Thousand Eyes, where they can find that great report you talked about during the show, and maybe how can they get started with Thousand Eyes? Sure. So uh, check us out on thousandeyes.com. And, and as you saw earlier, there's a couple really interesting things up on our website. There's a cloud performance benchmark. There's also a new product we launched called Internet Insights, which is basically a collective intelligence. Data is a service thing that shows you you know, tons and tons of stuff about how the internet is act the health of the internet. So, uh, so there's a, a lot of interesting new stuff that we've we've uh, put out recently. Uh, so check out the cloud report. I think you there you will learn a ton that you know you might not have known. Check out Internet Insights. It's give you an idea of just how much visibility we have across the internet. You can start a free trial generally, uh, you know, on our website or request a demo. And those are two good ways to, uh, if you want to actually get started, um, to, to go the DIY route with a free trial or, you know, request a demo and, and, and we can help you walk through what it is that you're trying to accomplish and, and get the kind of visibility a Thousand Eyes can offer. Well, folks, you've done it again. You sat through the neck, the uh, sat through an hour of the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe, according, uh, according to nine out of ten baby Yodas. I like that new show. Now, I want to thank everyone who makes that po this show possible, especially to my co-hosts in crime, our very own Lone Star State resident and expert in Wi-Fi, Miss Heather Williams. Mo, can the fo tell you folks at home where they can find you, all of your work, and what you're doing during the holidays? <laughs> well, you can you can see a bit of my snark. I'm at uh, Mo Better Wi-Fi on uh, Twitter. I uh, will probably be a little bit more active over the next couple of weeks as I'm uh, make my way to uh, London Black Hat. And uh, I wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving and uh, safe holidays. Thanks, Mo. Well, happy holidays to our other co-hosts in crime as well. My favorite security journalist around, Mr. Curtis Franklin. Uh, happy holidays, my friend. Where where can the folks find you, your work, and what you've been, what you're going to be up to? Well, as always, they can find my writing at Dark Reading, especially in the edge of Dark Reading. That's a special section for our feature stories and well, some of our articles that are a little bit more out there. And so, look for me at the edge, and I'll be uh, tweeting about all of that. Uh, from my account at KG4GWA. And also, uh, especially over the holidays, uh, look me up over on Instagram, Kurt underscore Franklin. Should be lots of stuff from travels and from the feasts of gratitude that are to come. Thanks, Kurt. We also have to thank you as well. You are the person who drops in each and every week to watch and to listen to our show to get your enterprise goodness. We want to make it easier for you to watch and listen and catch up on your enterprise news for the week. Now, go to our show page right now, twit.tv slash twit. There you find all of our amazing back episodes, show notes, co-hosts, and guest information, and the links we do during the show. Uh, and the stories that we do on the show. But more importantly, next to those videos, you'll actually get those helpful subscribe and download links. You can support the show by getting your audio version of choice, video version, HD video version, and listen on any one of your devices or any one of your podcast applications. Now, it's the best way to stay on top of your enterprise and IT news, but you got to subscribe, right? So you can impress your friends family members and coworkers, and you could share it with them. You could share Twyat with them, especially during the holiday season. Now, after you've subscribed, just remember, we also do the show live each and every week, 1.30 p.m. Pacific on Fridays. You can check that out at live.twit.tv. Of course, come see how the show is run. Come see the behind the scenes. Plus, if you're going to watch the show live, you might as well jump into the chat room live as well at irc.twit.tv. We love the chat room. We have some great discussions in there before, after, and during the show. Plus, we provide, actually provide some great content for the show as well. So go ahead and jump in there. Now, if you can't watch the show live or be part of the chat room, but still want to be part of the amazing community out there, come join the 24-7 discussion that's happening right now over at our new community location site at twit.com. Community. Now, all the hosts are out there, and the Twit community has some great discussions over the show content, hosts and guest information, as well as discussions about just overall common technology. Come out and join the Twit community as well. 
Now, if you want to also see what I'm doing outside of Microsoft, as well as what I'm doing during the holiday, maybe even some of my holiday company gripes, you can follow me at, over at twitter.com slash LuaMelm. It's informative, it's fun, so you can see all my posts there. Plus, you can also see what I do during my normal week at Microsoft. And if you want to check it out, you can go check out dev.office.com, where you can where we actually post all the latest and greatest ways to customize your office experience to make it more productive for you and your organization. I want to also thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support This Week in Enterprise Tech each and every week, and we couldn't do the show without them. I also want to thank all the engineers at Twit. Of course, also I want to thank Mr. Brian Chi Chibert. He's not only our co-host in crime, but he's also our tireless producer as well. He does all the show bookings and the plannings, and we really couldn't do this show without him. So thank you, Chibert. Uh, he's He's been lurking in the chat room there as well. So thank you again, Chibert. Of, of course, before we sign out, we have to thank our TD for today, Victor. Victor, uh, you, tradition for the show, maybe maybe your uh, your 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 uh, studio guest there can maybe help you out a little bit. Uh, what was the major here. topic of today's show? <laughs> uh, Padre was here briefly, but he, I think he took off he's already. Gone. He's gone. So, already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, thanks to Kurt's article, um, I. I have an 11 year old and a 13 year old, so we are deep in the future careers discussion, you know, right now with, with them planning their future education. And if my son had his way, he's right now going between music or professional wrestling. So thanks to Kurt's article, I think I know which way to kind of steer him. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that that is a good, good try because I definitely think that that's a great topic that we definitely covered. And we could definitely cover another show about that for sure. But I would say the major topic today's show was definitely network visibility. But but maybe next time, Victor, thank you so much for right. playing. <laughs> <laughs> and until next time, I'm Louis Moresca, just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Yeah.